All of us at Cove Street are both honored and delighted to present tonight's programming, a conversation between Joel Babb and Dr. Ann Collins Goodyear on the ancient crafts of medicine and art and how those two disciplines relate to each other. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the masterful realist land and cityscapes for which Joel is well known and which we show at our sister space, Green Hut Gallery. But I suspect fewer are aware of Joel's equally masterful series of surgical paintings, one of which is currently on display in conjunction with two of the brilliant drawings Joel did as studies for that piece. Dr. Goodyear, who wrote her dissertation on artistic collaborations between scientists and artists in the 1960s, is the daughter of Dr. John R. Collins, Jr., the surgeon depicted in Joel's painting. Joel Babb received a BFA in art history from Princeton in 1969. He studied with George Siegel and George Orton and spent a year in Munich and Rome before going to Boston where he earned an MFA from the museum school in Tufts. While there, his style changed from abstraction to contemporary realism. Joel has exhibited with a number of prestigious institutions including the National, Ac National Academy, the Center for Maine Contemporary Art, the Portland Museum of Art, the Banquet Museum, the Naples Museum of Art, and the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And his work is in a wide array of public and private collections, including the permanent collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Portland Museum of Art, and the Fogg Museum. And Collins Goodyear, PhD, is co-director, along with Frank Goodyear, of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. She's the former, former curator of prints and drawings at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, where she became the first curator to collect digital and time-based art. Goodyear has curated numerous exhibitions and published and lectured widely about modern and contemporary American art and portraiture. Without further ado, let's warmly welcome Joel Babb and Ann Collins. Thank you. When you read the title, Surgery at Cove Street, we're not actually going to do surgery tonight. <laughs> uh, I hope no one needs it. Um, but the, uh, it, it's great to be here, and I really wanted this uh, one of these surgical paintings that I keep in my studio to be here, uh, to be seen in Maine. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's out of my line. I'm, I'm basically happier painting landscapes and doing cityscapes, but uh, I do do figure painting and figure drawing. I've kept up my skills that way. The, uh, the story, my story about my association with surgical uh, practice begins with this painting. Not yet. How's that? There we go. Yes. Uh, this, is, uh, this painting hangs in the Countway Library of Medicine uh, at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And uh, it represents the first successful organ transplant in human beings. Uh, it was done by doctors at the Brigham and Women's Hospital there uh, in 1954. And the painting shows uh, Joe Murray, who is of, of that trio that are in the light most intensely. He's the figure on the left. Uh, the figure who's coming from the dark into the light is Dr. Francis Moore, who was the chief of surgery at the Brigham and Women's. And uh, Hartwell Harrison is this figure on the, on the right who is coming in from a hallway that connects, connected three uh, the three operating rooms that they had at the Brigham and Women's in those days. I mean, now they have countless number of them anyway. So Dr. Moore is carrying the kidney from the donor operation into the OR that's all set up. He's ready to transplant it into the recipient. So Dr. Moore, when we talk about this painting later, you know, he, he envisions himself coming through the door from the darkness to the light as sort of the dawning of a new uh, day in surgery because uh, uh, I had a different interpretation as I was working on this. I interpret the passage from dark, from, from the light in the far room 
to the, to the darkness and then coming back into the light as the period of unconsciousness when, when you have surgery. You know, I mean, I remember having my tonsils out and seeing a very bright light that sort of swam away and then, you know, and then where was I during that period of unconsciousness? Uh, well, I mean, it was actually physically there, but was I, was I actually there in, in another way? I was uh, gone. So the, the reason I interviewed for this commission, uh, because I, you know, I, I paint other things, but uh, is, is that I myself had heart surgery uh, when I was 13 in 1960. And it was a very traumatic experience, 1960. Uh, I think we just learned that the first surgery which corrected the kind of, of, of uh, what do they call it, when the, uh, congenital, mm -hmm. congenital heart defect. There was a hole that is open between the two, between the, the two atria of the, which is open for fetal blood circulation, but is then closes by the time you're born so that the heart functions normally. And mine hadn't closed completely, and that's a very common birth defect, which is, you know, I mean, a large percentage of people have it. But in my case, it was a new surgery, and they couldn't, they couldn't do it right away. They didn't want to do it. So I had to wait a year to have, to have the surgery. Uh, and the whole, you know, the whole year, was, it was dreadful to anticipate this because they had told me that I would not live out of my teens uh, if I didn't have the surgery. And so I finally had the surgery and it was, you know, it was not a very nice experience then. But uh, the surgery was a success, despite the trauma. And I went on to have a, you know, a vigorous physical life. And the main thing was I never thought about, I never thought about, uh, you know, my heart. The surgeon said, well, you know, I've seen your heart. The, the other guy walking down the street, you don't know if he has a heart problem or not, but I've seen yours, and so I lived that way. And then I had an amazing experience in 1987 when I was in uh, D.C. Well, I'd gone down to see an exhibition, and I was by myself in, in a hotel room, and I was, you know, and I said, oh, there's a TV in the bathroom here. I was shaving and watching a surgical program. Now, I, I, I shouldn't have been doing that because <laughs> a few minutes later, I woke up on the floor and someone was banging at the door saying, hey, sir, are you all right? You know, there, someone was yelling in your room, you know? And I said, sure, you know, I'm, I'm fine. But I realized, you know, uh, I still had issues about the surgery. And it, this, it, was, it was quite a surprise to me there. And I think, I think uh, that is one of the reasons why I answered the call to these, uh, you know, to interview for this, to get this commission, uh, you know, because I had a very intense interest in surgery. So uh, I also wanted to do a history painting. You know, one, one of my things is to take, take the older forms and imagine, okay, if you're gonna do a history painting, what would that look like in terms of contemporary times, contemporary art? And so I went to the Brigham and Women's and I met with, with Dr. Moore. And I think if I had known what impressive people Dr. Moore and the other doctors were there, I would have, uh, you know, I would have been too awed to take it. But I just, I got in, I hit it off with him and I got the commission. So the, the uh, as Dr. Moore presented this to me, in the atrium of the Countway Library, uh, there are some paintings that are hanging. They have a fabulous collection of, of medical uh, artwork in the Countway. And this is, this is a very large painting. It could be 12 feet wide. And it shows the first use of ether as an anesthesia for surgical procedure. So the, uh, this, the, uh, the, um, it was painted by Hinckley in uh, 1893, and he had worked on this for uh, at least a dozen years. The, the uh, scene showed is, is, is the dentist, William Morton, who has, who has an a, uh, inhaler, which is a, you know, the round glass object, which has a sponge in it, and then ether was poured into that sponge. 
And then the patient would breathe the ether vapors and, and Morton is holding his hand over the top of it so the ether doesn't evaporate and that evaporates very quickly. So uh, he's ha the patient is having a tumor removed by Dr. John Collins Warren and uh, uh, Dr. Moore and his, and his other doctors considered that this is the greatest surgical innovation of the 19th century. And he considered also that the, that the organ transplant, which they had done, was the greatest surgical innovation of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, uh, uh, modesty was not one of Dr. Moore's uh, handicaps. You know, he, he uh, <laughs> Dr. Moore got things done. And I was very impressed that he wanted a painting to, to memorialize this. And he wanted a painting that would be like this, just as large, and it would hang opposite uh, the ether painting in, in the Countway. So we started, he's, uh, oh, before, before I show you his, the sketch that he gave me, this was a photograph. There are only two photographs taken when this transplant actually occurred, December 23rd, 1954. It was a transplant between identical twins, the Herrick brothers, and you know, uh, everybody was so concentrating on, on the surgery that, no, that they didn't have a photographer to sort of document it. And Dr. Morris gave me this sketch. Uh, he said that this, the idea for this painting came to him in a dream. And, uh, and what, it, what it shows is a group of doctors who did the research, one of them was the person who, you know, Dr. Thorne was the chief of medicine, Dr. Harrison was a surgeon, but Dr. Merrill uh, did, did the, uh, was working on the kidney program. And, and so, in Dr. Moore's sketch, was a pretty awful beginning because it actually led to something that looks to me like a Trecento painting, you know, where the wall comes out and mm -hmm. abuts the picture plane and divides things completely in half, so that it's just not, not, uh, not very aesthetic at all. So I began to work on, on it and presented them a series of sketches. We had, we had a lot of meetings in which uh, a lot of the doctor's memories began to come back mm -hmm. about, you know, the events of the day and, and so my first, this was my first attempt to create what Dr. Moore had said. Now, if you can see very closely, I, I did a Renaissance sort of projection of, uh, you know, a, a perspective construction to create a checkerboard floor. And so I set the eye level for a vanishing point, which is up, up just beyond Dr. Moore's head. Dr. Moore is carrying the kidney from one, from one operation to the other. And, and then I was able to place the different figures in that space, in that pictorial space, which is a classic one-point perspective. So I, basically, I just said, you know, the only real document that we have about the reality of this, of this historical event was this one photograph. So I took, basically just took the figures and sort of turned them in space, fit them into that space, and, and then I, I had no idea what to do about the wall that was dividing the painting in half, but uh, this is my second study, which I showed to them, and it was just an attempt to, I raised the eye level, I, and I imagined a window that was the, where the doctors that were uh, observing the photograph, the doctors who did the research behind, uh, behind the, uh, uh, this transplant, and and yet and and so the wall no longer divided the painting in half. The wall, uh, you know, went went off the edge. And the third study. Whoops. There we go, having trouble with the... Okay, the third study is an actual three-point perspective where 
you you're have a higher point of view, and I want you to remember this because we'll be talking about three-point perspective later. So you can see the grid is a, is a little bit different because there's, there's a vanishing point to the left and to the right, and the verticals are no longer vertical. They converge at a point actually below the, the viewer's eye level, be below the viewer's feet in, a, in, a, in this. So, so after uh, Dr. Uh, Murray, Dr. Murray took me around operating rooms and, and I was able to uh, photograph surgeries. They wanted me to, you know, to learn what was actually going on when, you know, where the nurses stood, you know, where the sterile areas are and, and, and exactly uh, how an operating room functions. And, and one of the things that I learned was that th there was this cloth that divided the patient's head from where the surgeons are actually working. And the, the uh, Dr. Van Dam, who, who, was, who was the anesthesiologist here, told me that he always kept control of the patient's head. He's, he's leaning around and looking at an anesthesia machine and, they, and for this surgery, they did a continuous uh, spinal. At the, at the, I wanted to mention a point about the wall there because while I was observing surgeries and photographing them, a nurse came in and opened the door and began <laughs> to talk to, to uh, the doctors that you know from the hallway into where the doctors are working, and I and and I photographed her. And I thought this is the perfect solution for the wall mm -hmm. to have and to integrate the two different spaces together. And the doctors also did a lot of research in the archives and they came up with another photograph of the operating room. And the things to notice about this is that uh, there actually, there were three ORs at the time there were windows. You can see them off to the right here. And there was a scrub room between the two ORs that they used. And then they realized they'd have to turn it around because the, they were using the OR on the other side. And then up at the top, you can see a little bit of Dr. Cushing's amphitheater. He, he had, there was a viewing area which he designed to have the exact number of seats for the number of students there were at Harvard mm -hmm. Medical School at that time. And this is another view, this is another picture of that observation area up at the top. So at our next, you know, this is, uh, you know, the next drawing, the fifth study, the room is reoriented, the windows have been remembered, and they thought, well, we can't have a nurse opening the door, you know, it has to be Dr. Hartwell Harrison, who was the, who was the surgeon who took the kidney out of one of the twins. To have it, to have it transplanted, so. Doctor Moore and I then met in one of the ORs, and looking at the photograph, he tried to arrange all the instruments that they would have been used at that day, uh, in a way that I could photograph them closely to use to use in the uh, painting, and one of the things he said after everything was all set up, he and he had invited his his surgical nurse to come and help him do it. He said, okay, all we need is a patient, so hop up on the table. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was, it just reminded me how horrifying mm. that the idea of having surgery uh, mm. was actually. I, w I went home and I had surgical masks and gowns and I got models, like my wife Franny here is posing for the, uh, for the circulating nurse, I think, you know, in the photograph. And I wanted to do that because I had, my studio windows had a north light, which would be natural light, like the light in the, in the OR. And also there would be artificial light, which is a different color. And so it helped, you know, to see how the, how the colors would change. And then I had somebody that would pose for each, each of the figures in, in, in the painting. Uh, and then I have, uh, Uh, the unveiling the next year, the unveiling at Harvard Medical School. This is a photograph of that where you see 
You can see the various doctors, you can see the size of the painting. And uh, I am talking to Dr. Murray right there. That was a pretty spectacular evening. And one of the impressive things was that Dr. Moore had invited 25 guests of his own. And those 25 people at a, at a sign all went over and they stood in a row. They were all alive because they had received transplants of one kind or another. And that was just an amazing thing because they were, you know, ordinary looking people. You would not know mm -hmm. that they had had, that their lives had been saved by, by having transplants. So this is uh, my favorite picture of Dr. Murray with the painting in the background at the, uh, at the Countway. Now, just some thoughts about, uh, about photographing surgeries. I told Dr. Moore that I would like to do a contemporary surgical painting, you know, do a painting of a surgery that I could actually witness and photograph myself. And he arranged for me to go around with Elof Erickson, who was a plastic surgeon, and I photographed a number of surgeries. And I, this is not the one that I think is, that's not the one that is, you know, that I painted ultimately. But uh, it's, it shows, you know, what's difficult about, you know, getting, getting a, uh, there's such strong lights and darks from the light that they use, so that in my photographs, large areas were, were black. The sight lines are too crowded, you know, so that you never get a clear view of what's going on. And you have to keep your distance from the sterile areas, you know, so you really want to back off and not interfere with what anybody's doing. And so the, uh, this is my ultimate painting, the one that's hanging out, out in the hallway there. Um, it's a coronary bypass graft with Dr. John Collins, and I observed it in 1997. And having had heart surgery, it was an amazing experience because uh, I, you know, I was looking around taking pictures, but I was able to look and see the patient's chest had been retracted, and I could see the heart beating there. You know? And then at one point, it was hooked up to the heart-lung machine, the perfusion machine, and then, and then all of those pipes began to fill with bright red blood, you know, and I think, I think you can see a few there where it started, the perfusion machine has started to run. It was, it was like reliving my own experience, but as an observer of the happening with someone else. So it, it's, it was uh, quite, I suppose, therapeutic in a way to see this as an adult and to see it happening it just as an objective fact. The, uh, yeah, so I, I went around taking photographs from, from all angles of this, and the anesthesiologist said, come over here where I stand, and that is behind this, this, you know, this ether screen, I think they still call it that, you know, the blue cloth that separates the patient's head so I'm really standing, I'm in the zone of the, of the anesthesiologist uh, looking at all the apparatus that she has. And then if I get up, I can see what the surgeons are doing over the top of that screen. Well, actually, when I looked at all my photographs, I realized that you couldn't actually see this. And I have actually stretched out the patient and combined two separate points of view in order to do this, to, to give the illusion of this. But I did drawings at that time, 1997, and then I didn't paint the picture until 2010. And by that time, Dr. Collins, I believe, had already died. He passed away in 2010. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the uh, let me go on. I met, uh, I met Anne at an opening at Vos Gallery in 2012 mm -hmm. when, when I showed this painting there. Yeah. This you can see the profusion, the profusionist, and, and the surgeon's work is sort of off in the distance in the background. And then this is the view that put the two, two separate points of view together to make one. Maybe, yeah. Dr. Uh, Elof Erickson, who had taken me around the surgeries, called me up sometime later 
and said, are you interested in doing another surgical painting because we have done face transplants? And he sent me this article in the New Yorker from February 13th and 20th, 2012, that it is a, a very, it's an amazing read that explaining this, the case of this Dallas Weans. This is Dallas Weans' new face. I mean, he, he had electrocuted himself and burned his features completely off. And if you can imagine the complexity of doing a face transplant like this to get the muscles attached so that the lips and mouth can move. Uh, this particular patient regained his sense of smell from having the new nose attached to the nerves that still remained in his own skull, basically. So uh, I, really, I really recommend this. There's so many astonishing uh, uh, dimensions to the, to the idea of doing face transplants. Now, since I never witnessed a face transplant personally, uh, they sent me, ultimately, they sent me thousands of photographs and I spent weeks going through them, uh, and there was not a single one that could have been the basis for a composition, and, uh, except perhaps this one. This is, this is a, you know, on the basis of uh, just a wash drawing on the basis of, their, of the photographs. So this one is, is figures that are composed from various photographs and put together, the third rendering. As sort of looking at, the, looking at the surgery from the foot of the patient or from the head of the patient, those seem to be the two possibilities. Well, I took that drawing and then I used the computer to sort of cut out some other figures and, and uh, you know, and, and I presented all these, doc, all these pictures to the doctors. We had very helpful discussions uh, about them. In, in this case, uh, they decided they didn't want all of the figures. I mean, in some, some of these surgeries, there may be 20, 20 uh, surgeon, or, you know, uh, people working at the same time in coordinated effort. So what we did was, after, after honing it down to two possible compositions, we went into the ORs in the evening and we restaged it. So everybody got suited up and uh, one of the residents posed as the patient a young woman, and these are these are the three, the three surgeons. The one on the right is Bodan Pomahatch, who has really been in charge of most of the face transplants in Boston. And Elof Erickson is the is the tall one in the middle, with the large hands. And the other the other one is Julian Prebas, who's an Australian. So, the. Um, This was the final design. I just I added a couple of nurses and I added the, the microscope, the surgical microscope that they use for doing very fine work. And then this is this is a picture of the canvas itself in my studio as the underpainting. So it's you know I begin to work in oils. I transferred that drawing right onto the canvas, and then begin to do the lights and darks. Uh, no longer, no longer the resident's face, but the actual face from one of the, from uh, the Dallas Weans transplant. And so the underpainting enables me to do the lights and darks and to lay the colors into something that's not a, you know, a blank white surface. You begin to develop the colors like at this stage, and then a little bit farther on. And in the final version of it, a, this machine, uh, the cautery machine has been brought in at the suggestion of one of the doctors and all of those trays and instruments in the foreground are, were, are eliminated. So I, I think all of those suggestions were greatly improved the composition. And what we ended up with is not actually what you would see during the surgery because, because Dr. Erickson was actually specialized in harvesting the face, which is a separate thing. And then it has to be transported to the, 
to the surgeon, you know, to, to the other two surgeons. So they never were working together like that. So there's a bit of an allegorical uh, composite. Uh, it's like a group portrait, really, a group portrait to memorialize this surgery. And, and it's intriguing because it's a group portrait where everybody is wearing a mask, and yet it has to look like the, the people, and they, they, I think they are recognizable. The only one who isn't recognizable, isn't wearing a mask, is the patient, and the patient's getting a mm. new face. So it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's it. Thank you. And can you navigate that? That was fascinating. Thank you Good. so much. Am I in your way? Okay. Joel, thank you so much you for your comments. Um, I loved learning more about those amazing paintings. And as you've heard, I have a special relationship to one of them. Um, so I get to start by talking about my dad. Um, on Thursday, February 2nd, 1984, the first to heart transplant in New England took place. It's a moment that I remember well. On that date, Gerald Boucher received a donor heart from Rita Barker. The person who led the talented surgical team was my dad, Dr. John J. Collins, Jr. And I know that he always counted himself extremely fortunate to be part of an outstanding professional cohort at one of the world's leading centers for healthcare innovation, the Brigham and Women's Hospital. As if to demonstrate that the success of the first procedure was not a fluke, Approximately a week later, on, February, on Friday, February 10th, a second heart transplant was completed by the same team, this time preserving the life of a teenage boy, Matthew Shalalis. By mid-May of that year, three heart transplant surgeries had been accomplished. And by, tw by 2006, the hospital would become the first in the area to have performed 500 such procedures. Last year, nearly 4,000 heart transplants took place. And over the course of the past decade, such transplantations have set a record each successive year. In light of the rapid expansion of, the, of heart transplantation programs since the mid-1980s, it's hard to recall just how pioneering the procedure was four decades ago. Indeed, for me, only 14 years old at the time that my father and the surgical team he led made history in 1984, it would be approximately two and a half decades before I would really truly begin to appreciate the magnitude of what my father and his colleagues had accomplished. The work of two artists in particular, Joel Babb and Brian O'Doherty, helped to make this clear to me. My father's own respect for the arts was tremendous. A talented woodworker, my father also turned his manual dexterity to the art of tying flies. Perhaps most intriguing to me, my father, whose colleagues described him as an excellent technical surgeon, compared his surgical craft to a form of artistic expression, noting that his style of inserting and tying stitches was distinctive and recognizable to other surgeons, just as their techniques were apparent to him. If my father had a profound respect for art, he also loved history and embraced that of the medical field. Indeed, after concluding his surgical career, he served as archives director of the Brigham's Department of Surgery. In this spirit, I am confident that my father must have attended the unveil, must have been present on December 20th, 1996, when Joel Babb's painting, 
the first successful kidney transplantation, December 23, 1954, was unveiled at the Countway Library of Medicine at Harvard University. For reasons of time and in light of Joel's own superb remarks, I will not delve into a detailed account of this fascinating work and the important historical event it encapsulates. However, I would like to note that its sponsors, the Nobel laureate Dr. Joseph Murray, Dr. Leroy Van Dam, and Dr. Francis Moore, would go on to become important teachers, mentors, and lifelong friends to my father. I am intrigued by the juxtaposition of the final painting to the photographs that served as essential source material. The comparison brings to mind an analogy drawn in 1936 by the German literary theorist Walter Benjamin between the cameraman and the surgeon and the painter and the magician. Focusing on the image makers, Benjamin concluded, quote, there is a tremendous difference between the pictures they obtain. That of the painter is a total one. That of the cameraman consists of multiple fragments, which are assembled under a new law. Intriguingly, Benjamin's implicit observation that it is the surgeon, like the cameraman, who assembles fragments, came just three years after the very first attempted human-to-human -human kidney transplant, an event, that an event that transpired in Ukraine at the hands of a Soviet surgeon and which was reported on in Germany where Benjamin lived. In light of Benjamin's fascination with the fragments in which cameramen and by extension surgeons dealt, I do not think it is coincidental that one of the artists Benjamin knew and admired Marcel Duchamp had recently launched a new art form predicated on removing and reorienting fragments of familiar environments. The ready-made, of which the artist's 1917 fountain may be the most famous example, transformed the meaning of everyday objects by virtue of the addition of an inscription and the placement of that ready-made object in a new context. In the infamous case of Fountain, consisting of a reoriented men's urinal, shifted 90 degrees, placed on a pedestal, and signed by the fictional R. Mutt, Duchamp gleefully assailed the hypocrisy manifested by members of the Society of Independent Artists who barred the work from an exhibition for which, in theory, only payment of an entry fee was required on the part of the participants. The protest that this outrage permitted has become a classic in the field of modern and contemporary art. Time does not permit me to read it in full, but I wish to point out a few salient aspects of Duchamp's analysis of the Richard Mutt case. It is noteworthy in our present context that the artist identified the transplanted object as a piece of plumbing and an ordinary article of life that the artist had not made with his own hands. Rather, Duchamp stressed he had transformed its significance by granting it a new title and point of view, thereby creating, as he put it, a new thought for that object. Given Duchamp's delight in wordplay, it is worth noting that the popular allusion to surgeons as plumbers was well established in the early 20th century. And with this in mind, it is very intriguing to me that Duchamp's first attempt to transplant a men's urinal from bathroom into gallery, one that arguably failed initially, 
would happen shortly after the awarding of a Nobel Prize in 1912 to Alix Carrel, a French-American surgeon, a plumber of sorts, for his pioneering work in organ transplantation carried out in animals. The conceptual transformation implicit in seeing an object that functioned in one context as a plumbing fixture and in another as a work of art is profound. And it would take approximately four decades before the success of the artist's operation would be apparent. And this not until a duplicate transplant occurred in 1950 at a New York gallery when the artist authorized its proprietor, Carol Janis, to select a new urinal for the role of fountain. Intriguingly, this authorization was granted at the same moment that interest in human organ transplantation, notably of kidneys and hearts, began to be revived internationally and to demonstrate success. As we have already seen, the first successful human hit kidney transplant would take place in 1954 at the Brigham, with attempts earlier in the decade paving the way. Forward momentum on heart surgery was made possible through the invention of a new surgical device, the heart-lung machine, which could transfer the functioning of these organs to a mechanical device that oxygenated the patient's blood as it flowed through their body during surgery. And as Joel has alluded already to, the first use of it in 1953 to repair a young woman's interarterial inter inter septic, sep sorry, septal defect, which is to say, to repair a small hole between the left and the right atria in her heart was heralded as a medical revolution. At first blush, parallels between the development of transplant surgery and conceptual art during the 20th century may seem far-fetched. However, it is worth recalling that since at least the Renaissance, the work of advanced artists has gone hand in hand with that of physicians and surgeons in particular. One thinks, for ex example, of Vesalius, Rembrandt, and Aikens. Tonight, I would like to turn briefly to what I believe is the underappreciated relationship between conceptual art and the reconceptualization of the human body that made possible organ transplantation, most significantly that of the heart. In mid-October 1963, a one-person exhibition by the artist Robert Morris opened at the Green Gallery in New York. The show merited a short review in, in the New York Times by Brian O'Doherty, an artist and critic who had earned his MD degree in his native Ireland. Clearly inspired by the legacy of Marcel Duchamp, Morris's exhibition provides intriguing insights into how the elder artist's conceptual work would fit along, alongside the emergence of new attitudes toward the body. Among the works O'Doherty singled, singled out for comment was a novel self-portrait by Morris made from an electroencephalogram, or EEG, and signed and dated by the artist. As O'Doherty put it, he hangs it up and waits for you to come along and see it as art. Some will. Morris would later explain his process and its conceptual significance, and I quote, I went to NYU Medical Center and had the EEG made. I wanted to make a self-portrait, so I calculated the number of marks. In one second, the needle will travel so far. So I calculated the time that I would have to think about myself for the needle to travel the length of my height. And that was considered a self-portrait. Morris's interest in the documentation of thought itself was further driven home at the exhibition by the presence of two sculptures 
wax brain, and small brain. Placing these works side by side in the context of an art gallery, Morris effectively recapitulated the very experiment that had helped to establish the ready-made originally. Placing what appeared to be anatomical specimens in the context of an art gallery, Morris transformed them into art, just as Duchamp had transmogrified a urinal into a fountain, as Duchamp put it at the time, creating a new thought for that object. Appropriately enough, should anyone have missed the reference, <laughs> Morris also included his own version of fountain in that October 1963 exhibition. Morris had successfully transported or transplanted an idea. Turning to a slightly earlier work by Morris, we are reminded that the thinking artist has the privilege of standing upright in a pine box. When cerebral activity is absent, the box is horizontal. <laughs> the emphasis on cerebral activity as a marker of vitality would not be lost upon O'Doherty. And along these lines, it is worth pointing to another object in Morris's show, which may have aroused, aroused the critic's curiosity although it did not appear in his review. A piece quite simply entitled, Heart. With a shape reminiscent of Marcel Duchamp's own fluttering heart, the work by Morris was kinetic. Revealingly, when the work was exhibited in a group show in early 1964, after the 1963 showing that O'Doherty had seen, Donald Judd would refer to it as heartbeat, noting Robert Morris's heartbeat is a small box that has a heart shape cut in it. This, this is closed by a membrane that beats. The movement is fairly important to the piece. Trained as a medical doctor, Brian O'Doherty was in a particularly strong position to recognize the multi-pronged significance of what Morris had achieved, and to build on it still further. O'Doherty prescient, presciently recognized that the relationship between art and life was shifting, just as, the, just as the art of defining life was itself experiencing a sea change. In October, in October 1964, Exactly a year after the exhibition of works by Morris that O'Doherty had reviewed, Hannibal Hamlin would publish a groundbreaking study in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Life or Death by EEG. As Hamlin observed in his executive summary, quote, the bioelectric activity of the living brain is silenced by anoxia which soon produces cerebral death. Respirators and heart simulators can merely maintain the look of life in the face, in the face of death." Close quotes. As though to test the very question of the boundary between art and life and between life and death, Brian O'Doherty resolved to capture Marcel Duchamp's heartbeat in 1966. To this end, O'Doherty recorded its rhythm during a dinner party by using equipment borrowed from NYU, the same facility that had enabled Morris to make his EEG. Acknowledging that the heartbeat alone did not confer life, O'Doherty later noted, quote, with Duchamp's death in 1968, the artwork began its proper life, close quotes. In playfully exporting Duchamp's heartbeat and transferring it to another device, O'Doherty anticipated by over a year and a half the first human heart transplant, as the art, James, as the art historian James McManus has observed. The medical operation that transferred one human heart into another human body would be performed in December 1967 by the South African surgeon Christian Barnard. Barnard took the world by surprise with his bold action, 
undertaken while the medical establishment in the United States, the country in which Barnard had trained, continued to debate the nature of brain death. In Christian Barnard's dis disruption of the status quo, O'Doherty identified a conceptual revolution worthy as much of the arts as of medicine. To this end, trading on his medical training, O'Doherty delivered a provocative le lecture at the Dublin Medical Society in 1970, which would subsequently be reprinted a year later in Art International. As O'Doherty observed, and I quote, in all fields, including the arts, which are rumored to be the epitome of unorthodoxy, there are restraints imposed by our colleagues. We may only do what our colleagues allow, otherwise our reputations are at stake. Not only because we are daring, but because we have been daring in a way our colleagues do not permit. Indeed, although Barnard won immediate international fame, he would really never become part of an international community of physicians. But at the same time, if O'Doherty noted Bar Barnard's transgression, he also recognized that through his actions, Barnard had altered the nature of consciousness itself, changing our understanding of what it means to be human. As O'Doherty explained, if we follow up the implications of the detachable heart, we find Dr. Barnard's scalpel separating two ages from each other and calling the specters of what we might call identity past and identity future to confront one another across a division called consciousness. Intriguingly, the heart transplant would not become routine until the 1980s. The delay, as Duchamp might have turned it, in transporting these organs from one body to another with regularity was not due only, or perhaps even primarily, to the necessity of creating better immunosuppressant drugs, although that was certainly critical. Rather, the ultimate success of this procedure relied upon a reconceptualization of the heart as one of so many fragments comprising the body, interchangeable with any other, and ultimately subordinate to the animating energy of the brain. In short, we might say, the support of, support of the procedure from both the medical community and the general public relied upon the reconceptualization of the body as something akin to a Duchampian ready-made with its components available to be transported readily into new settings. At this juncture, as rem my remarks draw to a close, I would like to turn to Joel Babb's painting of my father conducting a coronary bypass surgery. Though examining, through, examining history and, through examining the history and imagery of Joel's painting, I have come to understand more clearly the recent history of coronary artery bypass surgery and to learn that my father conducted some of the very first in New England. I have renewed appreciation for my father's decision in 1971 to hire Dr. Lawrence Cohn, seen here performing the first heart transplant in New England with my dad. For Dr. Cohn would become another for Dr. Cohn, who would become another lifelong friend, had trained at Stanford with Dr. Norman Shumway, whose research into heart transplantation paved the way for Barnard's audacious first. Joel's painting shows my father doing something now understood to be routine. Indeed, the revolution of my father's activity as a surgeon resides precisely in the fact that the success of his surgical procedures permitted them to become standard procedure. While Christian Barnard jump-started heart transplantation surgery through his bold procedures in 1967, he did not succeed in making the operation common. Nor did, not only did he lack today's therapeutics for treating the potential for organ rejection, he also pushed forward at a moment 
when ethical deliberations concerning the relationship of the brain and the heart to life itself remained unresolved. It is probably for the latter reason that the high rate of failure around heart transplantation in the late 1960s led many physicians, including Dr. Francis Moore, to inveigh against them. The breakthrough of my father's efforts in the early 1980s cannot simply be attributed to technical skill, though such proficiency was critical. It also required the ability to understand that only a new way of seeing things on the part of the public combined with advances in medical technology could support such procedures. In 2000, as my father concluded his career as a surgeon and assumed his new responsibilities as archives director at the, Brigham Depart at the Brigham's Department of Surgery, he observed, the study of history is designed to improve our access to the future, not to enshrine the past. In this spirit, I would like to close with special acknowledgement of Joel's most recent surgical painting, one featuring the first full face transplant in the United States, done in 2011 at the Brigham. In considering the future of such therapies, I am inspired by the words of Dallas Weens, the patient pictured here, as he told one of his surgeons, Everything that you told my family that I would never do, I've done. Tell me what else I can't do, so I can. To my mind, Weens' comment epitomizes the relationship between art, surgery, and all other forms of innovation. The ability to imagine a new future in which the impossible can be realized and implemented. Through their, forward, through their work, forward-thinking artists such as Joel and Brian O'Doherty and the pioneering surgeons in their midst offer a prompt to future generations and through conversations like this we provide opportunities for their imaginations to converge. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. <laughs> Do we have time for a few questions? That would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. That was brilliant. I know that, uh, I mean, the, your last statement brought back to mind the fact that there was so much question when they did the first kidney transplant. Mm -hmm as to whether they should be doing it or not. They consulted with religious leaders and with philosophers, you know, about the ethics of, of doing it because uh, it was such a, a you know, a, a not a very high likelihood of, of a success, and in which case you, you, you deprived one brother of the kidney and mm -hmm. the other one died anyway. Uh, it would have ruined Dr. Moore's career, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and also, I mean, Dr. Murray, particularly, because he's a surgeon. And uh, so, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's right, that um, in view of the success of these procedures, I, I think it's very difficult to remember a point at which they were so controversial. And it's one yeah. of the reasons, Joel, that I treasure your painting so much of that moment, um, which has benefited um, from the memories um, that, that these um, pioneers um, were able to share um, and that have been built into this composition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, I think, uh, I sometimes look at this, at this painting, which uh, it was designed to be a pendant to the earlier painting by Hinckley. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Moore said, I want it just as big, you know, it was like 14 <laughs> feet wide. And so I convinced him, well, let's just make the figures the same size in both mm. paintings. And we won't, you know, mine won't be as big because we don't have that surgical uh, amphitheater of the, of the, uh, the ether dome with all of the other mm -hmm. spectators watching there. But, That's yeah. Any questions? Yeah, Carl. Joel, I was just curious as to where your surgery took place. Your own 
My surgery took place in Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. So uh, when I was going, going around uh, visiting these various surgeries with, with Dr. Uh, Murray, I talked to another surgeon who happened to be there and he, you know, about my surgery and told him about it. And he said, oh, that's interesting. I was at Children's Hospital. And so I was thinking for a minute, well, now he's, he's too young, you know, to have been present when my surgery was there. He said, thoracic surgery has really been improved. But I remember the, uh, uh, you know, afterwards being in an oxygen tent, which you know, no longer exists, and my parents not being able to see me, but able to come up to a door and peer through a little window uh, just to see if I was still alive and I could wave to them. But every 15 minutes, they had to put a tube down my nose and pump out the, you know, the uh, lower recesses of my lungs. And, and I can still hear that little comp uh, compressor running in my mind uh, at times. But, yeah. However, it was worth it to be alive today. <laughs> yes. You know, Bernie, I really couldn't hear. Did you hear? I, 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 it sound, I, it's a little bit hard for us to hear up here, but it sounds like you said that you, had, that you invited Dr. Barnard yeah. to Portland yes. and that he stayed with you. Yeah, and stayed wow. With you. Oh, sorry. I'm Fascinating. Right. Yes, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, that's so interesting to hear about your son. Um, for reasons of, of, of time, I, um, I compressed some of my remarks about the evolution of, or sort of the, 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 the um, crescendo of heart transplantation. Um, but it was interesting to me, I, I looked at some remarks that my dad made back in um, June of 1984. And at that time, he was, um, at that time, only the Brigham was authorized to do these transplantations. But um, even then, he, he said that he anticipated that there would need to be more units. And he anticipated that hospitals would be doing between about 15 and, and 35. And I was interested to see that some, some hospitals are, are getting above that, but that still continues to be about the range. I think one of, um, my dad had a, had a good sense of humor. And, and he said um, that one of the problems <laughs> was that that there are a lot of organizations designed to um, deprive them of donors, um, such as the manufacturer of helmets and seat belts. And <laughs> so he said one of the big, and then he was cute, he said, we, we support them. Um, but that one of actually the challenges is just making sure that you find the right person um, you know, to match with, with a patient. These nasty heart transplants in Maine. Right, right. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing those comments. I'd love to talk with you a little further, if we could, after the formal portion of our program. Did your father, Ed, have any artistic training? How did he learn to cut into a body?
whether you know you ever you know had artistic training. <laughs> no, but you know, until this very moment, um, I'd always been aware of the parallels between his um, <clears throat> tying flies because he also was an avid yes. angler and and sewing up people. <laughs> and until this very moment. I never made the connection between <laughs> the fact that he loved woodworking and cutting into things and what he did with the body. Um, I never made that connection. But um, as far as I know, he didn't have formal artistic training. Um, he also loved animals. He carved decoys and I mean, he just loved birds and he was an animal lover. He was an animal whisperer, really. Um, his sister was also actually quite a proficient artist, an amateur artist. Um, but I, I think actually my dad's pathway into medicine was truly a very, very deep love of the natural world and a desire to heal. And um, my dad had an innate capacity to, um, I think, to, to preserve life and to um, protect it. So I think that it was through that impulse that he learned um, through his desire to care for um, fellow creatures that he developed the skills that it took to do that. Did you see? Thank you. The, uh, you know, before anesthesia, surgeons had to be able to saw very fast. Mm. It's, yes, especially in scenes like the Civil War, you know, where amputations had to be done. Uh, time was of the essence because it was so painful for the mm. uh, patient. And, and uh, but I, I, I think of one thing. Uh, at one point, I actually went to BU Medical School for a semester and joined the anatomy lab so that I could draw from the dissections. Wow. And there was one, one of the professors there had, was a highly skilled medical illustrator and he had done many drawings uh, from the cadavers wow. thing. But what impressed me about surgeons is that they have such gr fantastic spatial relations you know, they, they measure, you know, T3, the third thoracic vertebrae down. They know what's this way, what's this way, this way, you know. And they have to be sometimes even spatially, you know, working from memory to, to find the coordinates of organs and things which they can't actually see at the moment, you mm, know. So that is a really phenomenal skill that is very similar to drawing, even though they're not actually carving or drawing something. That's really interesting. couldn't hear that. Oh. Yeah. I, I think the question was, but correct me if I didn't quite get this all, um, it had to do with the development of yet new um, technical means to conduct surgery, including robotics, and um, whether or not that was something that maybe Joel had had an opportunity to think about from his standpoint as an artist, uh, because it obviously has such tremendous ramifications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I had, I, you know, I haven't thought about that really. Um, one of the things that struck me was that the instruments that were in the photograph of 1954 and the instruments which they brought out mm -hmm. were very similar, you know, so that a lot of things about surgery had not changed uh, in the 40 years or so. And yet, with robotics, things really began to change a big, t big time. Laparoscopic and robotic uh, surgery, but it it requires sort of translating those manual and and spatial skills in a new way. You know, without without having your hands and being able to know where you are and, mm -hmm. and how you move through the human body. You know, you, having a robot isn't going to help you. It's going to make it even harder. So. No way, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, I saw surgeons that were perplexed. They had begun a surgery and realized that the cancer was too advanced. Mm -hmm. There was nothing they could do, and they were puzzling about, you know, I think about doing a heart transplant 
and the responsibility of you know uh, making a mistake or you know even somebody on the team uh, making a mistake it's just it's it's an incredible life i can't i can't imagine it you know they the uh, the hours they put in and the responsibility uh, that I've all, I found that incredibly impressive. So. Are there any more questions? I I might just offer one little observation. I think that question about um, uh, remote surgery is is actually a really interesting one in the context of of the mm -hmm. fine arts. In, in terms of this um, notion of visualization, you know, as, as Joel has alluded to, and um, the question of how um, the graphics for that, I know that it's, it's already happening, but I think it would be really interesting to hear about how the graphics for that are being developed. Um, because I, 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 bet, I bet somehow that there's an artist who has been advising the technical team on how to do that. And one of the things that actually was really interesting to me in that, in that sense, um, in looking at the documentation of some of the surgeries that we were discussing, um, certainly going back to the 50s and perhaps before that, is how similar the photographs that were appearing in the newspapers and so forth were to paintings by people like Aikens that were seemed so outrageous in the late 19th century. But I do think that there's a way in which artists help train the rest of us how to see things and how to think about things. And I think sometimes um, that really important role that the visual arts play in helping to define reality can be, can be lost. Um, and I also just want to comment, Joel, on your really beautiful comments about the, um, the first um, face, or not the first, but the first um, American face yes. transplant in 2011. It was really beautiful what you said about the surgeons in masks oh, I know. and yeah, the fact funny. that the one person unmasked is the guy who's actually getting a whole new face yeah. and I, I feel like you've given us um, so much food for thought and a real lens into thinking well, about you. the future so thank, thank you, you. Yeah. It's, yeah. I agree, just phenomenal. I, I think that there are two, two questions, one in the back and then right, right here. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It, um, I think one of the things, um, and I have to credit Joel for helping encourage me to really think about um, the nature of surgery, but one of the things that was really fascinating to me was to realize, and actually, and Brian O'Doherty also, who um, was, was a medical doctor and an artist, uh, helped me to understand is that the idea to take a heart out of a body it's not like an obvious thing to do, um, especially when, when life has been associated with it for so long. So it was sort of fun rolling the clock back a little bit and just to see some of these shifts that we begin to see in the art world that seem to anticipate attitudes towards the body. So thank you so yeah, much. It's very exciting to um, see how you line up the, the dates of it all. That was just very interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No, it was, it was it, that that was that was fun to see those correlations. Um, the the precision of surgery um, certainly uh, works perfectly with the photo realism of mm -hmm. Joel's work. And I'm wondering if either of you are aware of some other artist who approached this subject matter in a 
Interesting. You know, the, uh, the first commission, the first organ transplant, uh, there were no photographs to begin with, and so it had to be sort of distilled from the memories of the doctors. It was the time spent interviewing them and gradually accumulating ideas. And, and, then, and then from that chaotic mess of lines that Dr. Moore gave me you know, to conjure up, some organized representation of this. It's interesting. The face transplants, there were, there were say, 3,000 photographs, but not one of them made a good composition, you know? So the, it interested me in doing these that, that you had to, you know, to bring some kind of an aesthetic and, and per perceptual order to, to all these, you know, thousands of different uh, uh, inputs and and that that I think you know when I when I look at this painting there are certain things I would paint very differently now you know if I could have uh, if, if I'm a better painter now than I was then probably but this composition really expresses you know it, it's it really expresses a lot of ideas in a suggestive way and and uh, you know, it, it, it isn't sort of a photoreal thing at all, and and yet I th and so I I still like it very much, you know. But the uh, of the three certain the three paintings were very different processes, and and the results are very different, and it, it's interesting to me. You, you know, your question is also really interesting, or your observation. Um, when I think about descriptions of the invention of the heart-lung machine. So one of the things that, I mean, as we know, the heart-lung machine enables blood to be circulated through the body without going through the heart. But the thing that was so revolutionary about that is that doctors could finally see the heart clearly. And once they could see the heart clearly, it was clear how to mend a little hole between two atria. So again, what seems like today, in a funny way, no big deal, to do that little surgical um, stitching that would then allow the lines of the heart, the, 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 the um, tissue to grow back together, couldn't be done without the ability to see the heart. And so what you say about vision, I think, or this notion of sort of the photorealist um, vision, I think is extremely important. And actually, and sort of thinking about your point too, one other really interesting detail about Duchamp's own body, by funny coincidence, is he actually had a heart murmur, and, um, which is sort of funny. So those hearts that he did, I think, were a little bit of a reflection on that. And it was actually in his case, because he had a heart murmur, that he was considered unfit for service during World War I. And one of his problems is that nobody could tell he had a heart murmur. Mm -hmm. And so he was just being derided in the streets of Paris um, around 1915. And that's why he came to the US when he did. So and there are all of these very funny um, things that one begins to put together in new ways. And I mean, it's conceivable thinking about that, that Duchamp may have been sort of tuned into sort of internal plumbing. Um, in a way that, you know, maybe hasn't previously been considered. Um, so it is, it is sort of interesting just to go back and look at the way in which medicine was revolutionizing the way people thought so much about the world around them, and vice versa, how the art was revolutionizing the way that physicians could see the body as well. Yes, I'm just wondering. Any, any new projects in the works? No, not at the moment. And, and how, how do you bridge going back and forth, which I assume you were doing at the time when you were doing your, your other work? And yes. How, how was that bridged? Um, no, it's, it's invigorating. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, I have a habit of doing cityscapes. Uh, some aerial cityscapes, you know, I became obsessed with perspective early on, and, and 
and, and I used that skill in doing, in doing the designs for these, uh, uh, you know, the three-point perspective in the, in the uh, bypass operation and, and the uh, drawings that I was doing to, to design this. So, you know, they really, they are related. Uh, it's, it's, I'm glad I didn't specialize too much and I'm certainly, I love to paint and draw the figure and I do that on a regular basis anyway, but I never show those paintings. You know, I, I don't, don't want to be a portrait painter either, although I have done five portraits for the Countway of, of, uh, uh, of doctors, mm -hmm. particularly some of the doctors that, that should have been in the Countway and had already died and that had to be sort of uh, done to look like they were done from life, but they were done from photographs. Mm. Yeah. I think if there are no more questions, we should wrap it up with okay. gratitude. That was really, I really, really Thank you. <laughs> Could I say before we, before we leave, I brought some books in. Uh, I brought, this book is really good for the general public. It's written by a writer that I know who, who is now living in Florida, but her husband was a surgeon, a pediatric brain surgeon, I believe, who trained under Dr. Moore mm -hmm. at one time. And, and this is about, this is really a, really a good story about, about the discovery the, the, the scientific discoveries behind transplantation and the drama involved, the, you know, the heroic patients, it, it's really excellent. And there is a book for, for uh, doctors and for people who are more interested in the medical technicalities, this book by Dr. Uh, Nicholas Tilney, and, uh, which is uh, published by Yale. It's about transplantation in general. So, and if you want to look at this book is written by a surgeon in Australia, and he has some very interesting, some many uh, amusing surgical paintings. You might want to flip through this while you're here before you leave uh, tonight. Be good. <laughs>